Okay, thank you very much. All right, I'm, I'm coldly aware that the, the line in the schedule after me says drinks, so, uh, so I won't keep you waiting for too long. Um, but what I want to talk about is the kind of the, the other side of operations, is uh, the, the, the kind of cold hard fact that things do go wrong, and uh, how we've been on a journey at Skybank and Gaming about how to change how we react when things go wrong, and how we can better sort of control the situation and use every time something goes wrong to improve our organization. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Um, who am I? I'm head of platform and operations for the bet side of Skybetting and Gaming. We're kind of internally split into a series of what we call tribes. I guess you could call like business units uh, and betting and gaming being two of the obvious ones. So on the betting side, uh, I run the platform operations. That means I am responsible for the 24-7 the stability of our products and services. Um, but what we need to realize is that 100% uptime is neither achievable nor in a lot of cases useful because we also need to advance as a business. And it would be very easy to aim for 100% uptime if we had no need to advance as a business. If we could basically just say no changes, no releases, no nothing happening in the live environment, we would get much closer to 100% uptime. We need to acknowledge that the world does change, but then try and craft a, a kind of safe, um, a sort of a, a best practice driven world, which allow us to progress the business in a way which works all around. So I first joined uh, SPG in 2010, and in that time we have changed a lot, um, an awful lot. So at that time we, were, we weren't even in Leeds, we were in a, a little office in Harrogate, um, and we did some great stuff, but in that time, our growth has been um, breathtaking, is the word. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that, but in that time, it's also worth bearing in mind we've adapted a lot. Um, crucially, through learnings from things we've experienced, from bringing people in, new ideas, etc. And the world around us has changed. We've heard about the growth of cloud, about different software engineering techniques. So we need to adapt, we can't stand still. And one of the areas we've adapted is in how we respond, how we manage and respond to incidents. What we've embraced is a concept which is known as instant command. It's, it, instant command is a, it, it's a great title and it, it feels like one of those things where you should be wearing a cape and have a mask and fly into an incident. It, in reality, before I can really talk about what incident command is in our world, we need to talk about what is an incident. So generally speaking, an incident obviously is a, a disruption to business operations. Um, in Bet Tribe, our most crucial business operations are actually customer facing things. So the instance which um, we, it's wrong to say we care about them the most, but the instance we spend the most time kind of thinking about and analyzing and learning from are often customer facing disruptions. Um, to give you an example, uh, one of our incidents, I say one of our incidents, this is the worst, most impacting incident SBNG has ever had. Um, we have talked publicly about it before. I can see the worried faces on uh, my director and CTO. Uh, this happened quite a while ago. So this was Boxing Day 2014. This was before we adopted the concept of incident command I'm going to talk about. Um, what happened on this day, so Boxing Day, to put this in perspective, is every year it's basically our second busiest day of the year. So our, our growth curve looks like um, we, we grow an amount each year. The biggest day of the year is always Grand National, um, which happened uh, what, a week or so ago. Uh, for this year, that's always by far the biggest day of our year. But between Grand National and Boxing Day, our normal growth has happened so much that Boxing Day itself is actually uh, always a really big day as well. So it's a big day for the technology stack. It's a big day for the business as well. Um, what happened in 2014 took us somewhat by surprise. So it's a sufficiently big day. We have tech teams on site watching all the um, technical services and everything is going absolutely fine. Uh, this is a graph of Apache workers. So we run Apache PHP as the, the kind of the first thing which any requests hit uh, in our stack. 
The green line is the important one. So the green line is how many spare Apache workers we had. Spare means more requests can come in. That's great. What is really bad is what happens about here, where suddenly, and with no warning, there's no ramp down to this, suddenly all of our Apache workers disappear. And those green line changes to a, a yellow line. So yellow line basically means that Apache worker is doing stuff and is not available for more requests. So uh, our monitoring systems, the people on site, have absolutely no warning that all of a sudden, effectively, our website disappears. We don't just care about technical metrics, though. So as a, a business metric, uh, the graph bets per second for the bet tribe is basically our most important sort of business metric. Uh, you can see as soon as we lose all Apache workers, the business impact is all of our bets disappear, effectively. All of our traffic that's happening suddenly drops to zero. This is bad. This is very bad. Um, from the, I was reading back the notes whilst writing these slides from the support log. This is my, my second favorite line ever in a support log. Never seen the likes. We're going to banner up as customers cannot do anything on the site. So uh, really bad. And what was even worse is no kind of, no idea about what had caused this. Um, like I say, all, all anybody saw was that suddenly our website disappeared. So what do we do? Well, possibly this is a DDoS attack. We have various levels of DDoS protection. We have different ones now than we did in 2014. So the first thing to do is to say, OK, may maybe this is some kind of major traffic event. Um, let's kick in more levels of DDoS protection. Uh, unfortunately, no difference happened. Um, so that line in the support log, which said, OK, customers can't do anything. We're going to banner up and try and get control of the situation. So we bannered up. And magically, the site recovers. So this doesn't really tell us anything. So what we really want to happen is we banner up the site, and then we have time to sort of forensically look into what systems are broken, try and fix them. Um, unfortunately, as soon as we bannered up, everything started working again. No sign of what was wrong. So OK, we now have a working site. Let's unbanner and try and get some customer service back. Uh, as soon as we unbanner, the site dies again immediately. So we're in this situation where the, the, the site works when we're trying to look into what's broken and doesn't work when we have customer traffic on it. Um, so a lot of head scratching happening at this point. So I guess long story short, what we eventually discovered this to be was a particular document in our Mongo database. So we use Mongo as a kind of um, uh, almost like a cache of rendered pages so that we can, so that our actual PHP has to do not very much work. Pages have already been sort of pre rendered, albeit into JSON format, into Mongo. And that's, I guess, a little bit like the kind of boxes around those nano service areas of content. We have documents in Mongo for the different bits of our page. Uh, about a month before Boxing Day, we'd launched a new service, which, as part of its Mongo document, needed a calendar of all the horse racing events but in, on a kind of day-by-day -day basis. What it also had each day was all of the information we needed to render the page um, for the horse racing part of the site. And we'd tested it, and when we launched this service, we put lots of load through it, and we did all those kinds of good non-functional testing, functional testing, et cetera. What had happened in between in the, the subsequent month after we'd launched it is the bit we'd missed was that every day, we added more entries into this calendar document. So every day, this Mongo document got bigger and bigger and bigger, which again is all right, um, until the level of traffic we got on Boxing Day crossed a threshold where all of the web servers requesting this Mongo document on all the page requests suddenly saturated our network. And it completely saturated our data center network. And basically, up until the network saturated, it worked absolutely fine. But it crossed the threshold, suddenly everything stops. What's even worse is when the network's saturated, you can't even diagnostically access servers because the network's saturated. So again, we, we've changed a lot since then. Um, lots of things like out-of-band management access, et cetera. But at the time, we were faced with spontaneously broken system and not good kind of structures in how to get visibility and uh, debug this. Uh, situation. So what happened after that is my favorite ever line from a support log. 
all done, not a good day. So the site recovered. Um, we did eventually find the problem, recovered uh, systems. It was a painful day and not a good day, quote. So that's the kind of incident we're talking about, major, major incidents which hugely impact excuse me, business operations. So what we've done since Boxing Day 2014 is looked a lot more at how we organize ourselves during major incidents. And like I say, adopted this kind of concept of incident command. So incident command originally um, is described in this book. It's a, it's a great book. Um, it originally came out of some people who studied the California Fire Department, in fact, worked at the California Fire Department, looked at how wildfires were spreading across bits of California and how that could be managed. Um, obviously, a, a fire spreading is a risk to life, is a, a situation that's getting out of control. So they studied how the California Fire Department organizes itself during these kinds of major incidents and then tried to apply that to complex IT incidents. And they, they called this whole concept incident command. They talk about it a lot in this book. We um, thought this was a great idea. It's often worth looking outside your industry to get inspiration about how to, to deal with various kinds of scenarios. Another great industry to look at is the aeroplane industry. Um, they have a kind of mentality that when things go wrong, you shouldn't necessarily automatically blame the human who was involved, but, and, and if you do that, you don't kind of, you don't get honesty about the learnings. We'll come back to that. How we interpret incident command is as a dramatic change in our ways of working, our focus, and our organizational structure with the single goal of restoring service for customers. And I call this a dramatic change because our day-to-day -day work is very driven by a squad or uh, the, the owner of a technical component, the team who owns it, being very autonomous in their decision making and kind of figuring out what the best thing to do to satisfy the product innovations and the, you know, the, the needs are. That's absolutely fine. During an incident, that goes out the window. We have a very controlled structure. We change our ways of working. We stop doing things which would like evolve the product, et cetera, and we single focus on trying to restore the service. It, this isn't rocket science, but it's worth stating anyway. It is a change to our normal kind of day-to-day -day ways of working. But what does that involve? So during an incident, we have someone who's whose job, who's named the incident commander. Now, this isn't a normal job. We don't advertise on our website for someone to work for us as an incident commander. It's, uh, it's a rotor, it's a, a set of people who are trained in a set of behaviors and who know what to do when major incidents kick in to try and get the fastest possible recovery to this. An incident commander is responsible for directing the technical team. They're the, the, their one focus is to try and get control of a complex situation with often lots of different people involved. Our Slack channel, particularly if an incident happens during work hours, our Slack channels go absolutely crazy with all sorts of people going, oh yeah, I'm seeing this error, I'm seeing this, me too, if I do this, this. An awful lot of information happens, often duplicate, so the incident commander needs to try and get control of that and to try and direct the technical resources available in as best a way as possible to uh, restore service for customers. What they're not responsible for is external comms. So when things break, obviously lots of people around the business, whether it's our contact center, whether it's our leadership team, whether it's other products and services within our business, lots of people need to know what's going on so that they can manage their customers and their experience as well. The incident commander is not responsible for this. We have a separate identified role, usually adopted by one of our service managers, and their job is purely to get the comms out, but crucially their job is not to direct the technical teams. So we, we, we adopt very distinct roles during these kinds of major incidents. Incident command is also a style of communication. So when major incidents happen, um, like I say, lots of people pile into our Slack channels. Communicating in Slack is, is an art form, and lots of people adopt it in all sorts of different ways. If it's a regular Monday, then chat all you like in Slack, do whatever you like. During an incident, the last thing I want you to do is either tell me things I already know, although that's not the worst thing, 
but I definitely don't want you to spend a good three minutes writing your message as to what's happening in the style of War and Peace. And then when you finally press enter, all I can see whilst you're doing that is James is typing. When you finally press enter, I then have to mentally pass a whole wall of text before I actually understand what you're trying to say. This is quite different from like a phone call or like a, a sort of in-person conversation because in, in a kind of voice channel, I'm mentally passing what you're saying as you're saying it and I'm already preparing my response. Whereas in a Slack channel, obviously I can't even start that until you've pressed enter. So the style of communication we adopt during incidents changes and we ask people to be brief, to, be, to press enter more often, basically is the summary of it. Um, brevity is important. It's also a set of behaviors. So the IC themselves, like I say, we, we train our people who um, adopt this IC role, um, and we don't train them in technical, um, in like how to fix load balancers or how to fix software. We train them in a set of behaviors and about why the things they do affect how quickly we can recover in terms of how they direct our technical teams. So useful things they can do are break down the problem into smaller problems. You, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. If you have a complex failure, it's often useful to break it down into smaller um, things to look at, things to learn about, and say, okay, you, go look at that. Don't worry about anything else. Now you, go look at that. And when you have something useful, tell me about it. And I'll then use that information to direct our next response. They're also RICs responsible for preventing interference. Um, this could easily involve asking, stroke, telling politely senior people in the company to, to back off or to, to say, thank you very much for your input. We're aware of that. Now we're going to get back to what we're doing. Um, this is absolutely fine. Everybody in our organization understands that we have an incident response structure and that people have different roles during that than at other times, that's fine. The IC is also responsible for thinking about people, particularly during long incident responses. Um, it's quite a sort of adrenaline-fueled, exhausting thing to be part of, and the IC needs to be aware of rotating people, of telling people, hang on, we've been looking at this for two, three hours now, just go take a bathroom break, go have a drink. And that, that can make the next few hours so much more efficient because people aren't flagging. If people do start flagging, then get other people involved. Send people home, send people back to bed when other people are available to take over. Um, we also adopt this concept of the CAN report, which stands for Conditions, Actions, Needs. So our ICs every 15 minutes during major incidents um, restate the current understood conditions of the incident. So for example, website is down, we know that Mongo is saturating our network. The actions, which will be things like, I've asked this person to go look at that, I want data on this thing, and that's this person who's looking at that. And the needs, which are essentially actions that haven't really been assigned yet. So that might be, I need to know what the state of our Mongo is, but I haven't assigned that to anyone yet. So. Restating this every 15 minutes means that if for some reason you haven't well communicated that you need a thing or that somebody's responsible for a thing, then that's re-reminded and that everybody kind of resets on their current state of the incident response. One of the most crucial behaviors for an IC though, and this is one I myself am terribly guilty of breaking, is that you are not there to fix the problem yourself. You have a team of engineers. It is so tempting to start logging onto servers and start looking at database configurations and the like, that is not your job. You have people to do that. If you're doing that, you're not directing the incident response. So I will happily tell people to tell me to stop doing stuff during an incident. However, how well you respond to an incident is only 10% to do with what happens during the incident. And that is a completely accurate statistic, which we have data behind, and I didn't just make up at all. The, the sentiment is important, though. Um, what, you, what actually happens during an incident is far more relevant what happened in the run-up, or what happened before the incident, but also what happened after the previous incident. And why is that? It's for, for several reasons. 
predominantly, though, because people panic, particularly during major incidents. Um, people panic in um, kind of rabbit in the headlight kinds of ways. So if, you're, if you get a call at 3 a.m. or even worse at 3 p.m. on a Saturday saying website is down, your brain kind of enacts a sort of fight or flight mode where you're kind of generally, a lot of people when first faced with this scenario will freeze, won't really know where to start looking and they need that kind of direction from the incident commander. What's even worse is if it's the incident commander who freezes. So people panic and the only way to combat this is not during the incident. So this is where it's really important what happens before the incident. The best way to combat these kinds of brain chemistry behaviors is to fall back on habits. All we can really rationally use are habitual behaviors. And so what we need to have done is built the habits into people so that when that scenario happens, we fall back on habits which are useful and productive and help us get out of the scenario. And the only way to do that is to practice. Habits are only formed by practicing. And if you're not very good at practicing because it's not something you've really done before, you need to practice practicing. <laughs> and this, I guess this is a kind of way of saying start simple. Don't just kind of run the most complex kinds of fire drills every week because all you'll do is teach people they don't know how to respond to complex scenarios. You need to start simple, convince people that they can respond to situations and then progressively ramp up the complexity until those habits are formed and they're formed really well. The other thing to do before an incident is to agree on a certain set of parameters. Uh, things like how to communicate. Everybody needs to understand that war and peace in Slack is a bad thing. Um, what powers does the IC have? So we have this kind of internal standard that during a major incident, an incident commander can effectively do anything. And that could involve bannering up the site. It could involve shutting down the data center. I've never done that. Um, but they are, we, we grant them the kind of powers to be able to do this. In return, they are responsible for consulting anyone available to get input and advice before they take decisions. What we will do is later analyze the decisions and learn from them and see if they were the right decisions and then modify things next time. Also useful to know who adopts which role during incident, who is that external comms person, who is the IC, etc. And important, once you've figured those out, is to practice them. Because what you really don't want to be doing is figuring these things out during an incident either. So again, build them in as habits and practice them. A, a small aside on communicating, um, something we take all of our incident commanders through is, uh, is a game. It's a great game. I am absolutely not affiliated with them, but you can download it. It's a free game. It's called Space Team. It's, a, it's described as a cooperative shouting game. Uh, it looks a bit like that. Um, what, what it is is basically three or four or five people are piloting a spaceship, and this spaceship is falling into the sun. That's fine. The spaceship knows how to get out of the sun. All you need to do is tell it which buttons to press. And what you end up with is a set of controls on your screen and a set of instructions, but those instructions aren't necessarily for your controls. Sometimes it'll be for other people's controls. So what you have is three, four, five people trying to tell each other what buttons to press whilst also listening to what other people are telling you and trying to press the buttons on your screen. It's a great game. Um, cooperative shouting game is accurate. If anyone wants to play it later, grab me a drink. So I will happily play Space Team forever. So those are things to do before an incident. Just short note on after an incident is equally important so that you're ready for the next incident. Retrospecting is important in everything we do in the business, but really important for incidents. Retrospecting does not mean assigning blame. So I mentioned this earlier, this is a learning predominantly from the aircraft industry. Um, it's talked about a lot in this book, which is also a great book. Um, if you assign blame to humans, you will stop people being honest about what they did and why they did it. You will not learn. You will get a modified set of events and the organization won't improve how it needs to. So how we do this briefly, we analyze the timeline. Um, so we look 
at each thing which happened, and this is where Slack is really useful, because it automatically timestamps. We look at every decision which is taken and look at it in the context of the information which is available at the time the decision was taken. Hindsight is amazing. You don't have it during an incident. So we need to look at what information was available to understand the decisions that were taken. And then an output of that, analyzing it, might be, well, actually, we should make different information available so that we can take different decisions next time. Um, we also break down the time to recover into these kind of well-defined sections. So time to identify. As soon as something breaks, you don't necessarily know it's broken. So there's, a, there's an amount of time to figure out something's broken. Uh, time to know what the problem is, time to fix the problem, and then time to validate what it is. And what you might find is that several of these will be kind of two or three minutes, but one of them might be 20 minutes. So the, the, the place to focus your analysis is on the, the biggest window, effectively, if your goal is to reduce the overall time to recover. Also crucial, though, is to distribute the learnings. As an organization, we are quite big these days. Um, an incident will never really involve all parts of our business, but the next incident might involve a different part of the business. So distributing our learnings is the only way we can propagate this learnings quickly. I mentioned not assigning blame. That's really difficult for some organizations to do or to not do. If you must assign blame, the place to assign it is on the system, whatever the system is, but it's almost certainly not a human. Humans will always err, error, make errors. You've got to acknowledge that humans will always make errors and look at why the system allowed the human error to impact customers the way it did. A learning from this could be, well, actually, if we're going to do something which is going to drop all our servers out of the load balancer, maybe the thing which dropped them out needs to add an extra checkpoint to say to the user, did you really mean to do that? Because that would be a pretty bad thing to do. Once you've identified why the system allowed that to happen, uh, Go fix it. Don't blame people, or you won't learn from the experiences. So as a final thought, and I promised earlier I'd try and make an argument that incidents are good for an organization. Well, I've touched on it a little bit, but every incident which happens is an opportunity to make the organization better. Incidents happen because of complex combinations of things going wrong, whether it's single points of failure, whether it's processes which are broken. We are generally very good at thinking through everything which might break and anticipating it. We're very bad at thinking of when more than one thing breaks or when things interact. So every time an incident happens, you learn another way that your organization might break and you get to fix it so that it doesn't happen again. So incidents are opportunities to fix problems in your organization and to generally make your organization better. So that's my argument as to why incidents can be a good thing for your organization. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>